Um, but guys, uh, recently when we were, just two weeks ago actually, we were working through the book of Acts in our small group, um, and we were reading this passage when Paul calls the Ephesian elders to come chat with him, um, I was deeply struck by his incredible faithfulness, and I was very aware of my lack of faithfulness as I read this, this passage, or as we worked through this passage, and so I really felt to kind of bring you an encouragement in that direction this morning, that we together would be faithful to what Jesus has called us to do in the city, what he's called you to do in your life. And so we're going to look at that passage. Karen is going to read for us in a moment, but one second. Typically, when we describe someone as faithful, we don't mean, yo, Dave, that guy is a man of faith, right? We, when we say Dave is a faithful guy, he is someone that we can put our faith in to do the job that he's been asked to do. Are you in agreement? Nod. Yes. Okay. So we're not saying he's a faithful guy because he's got so much faith. When you say faith, you have to say faith. You see, a faithful person is a person who others are able to put their trust in. A person who is true to their word. And I think we all kind of want to be those kind of people, right? I think all of us would love at our funeral one day for people to say, Tono was a faithful guy. Francoise was faithful. A faithful woman. That's, that's what we would like. I'm guessing, I'm guessing. That's what I would like. I'm guessing that's what you would like. But I think as a character quality and potentially even as a fruit of the Spirit, this is something that is in short supply. If I look at my own life, I'm aware of my weaknesses. But I think it's always been like this, because if you go to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 20 verse 6, we read, Many a man proclaims his own steadfast love, but a faithful man who can find. And so this isn't a common thing to find in society. And yet, I think we are called to pursue Jesus and to be like Jesus in being faithful men and women. And so, I want to encourage us in that line this morning. Let me pray. God, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you, Lord, that you're with us. God, thank you that you are building this church. And thank you, Jesus, that you are the most faithful one there ever has been. And I pray that you would take these words this morning and that, Holy Spirit, you would teach us and encourage us and inspire us and enable us to live faithful in Joburg in 2024. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Karen, please come and read for us. It's Acts 20, verses 17 to 35. And it says, Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and the trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you all this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. 
for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And they were, then there was much weeping on part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again, and they had accompanied him to the ship. Thank you so much. Okay, that's a long passage. And uh, the way we're going to approach this is I've kind of broken it down into four sections. And we're just going to go through each section. And just to encourage you, the last two sections are very short. So if I take a lot of time on the first two, it's not going to be like that all the way through. Okay. So the first section, we see Paul looking back on what has happened. He's looking back on life. And there's, a, there's kind of a sense in it that he's calling us to follow him to be like him, to carry on like him. It says that he served God with tears and with trials and in all humility. Now, these people, the Ephesian leaders, knew well his story of how he'd been abused, all kinds of painful um, experiences experiences he'd had, had indignity, offense, left, right, and center, And I think as we look at Paul's journey, we see someone who didn't think much of himself, but thought much of Jesus. He didn't think much of himself, but he thought much of Christ. We see too here that he was courageous in teaching and charging them. He didn't back down. And the reason for that was for their benefit, not for his benefit, not so that he would look smart or clever or together, but it was for their benefit. And we know that. Because if you go to Colossians 1.28, he writes, Him, that's Jesus, we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom. Why? That we may present everyone mature in Christ. See, Paul's goal as a leader was to present those he was leading mature in Christ. Holy before the Father. And so as we... Seek to be faithful in our journeys. I want to encourage us when people come to us and challenge our thinking or challenge our way of life, that our default shouldn't be, I'm offended. How dare that person give an opinion on my parenting? But rather, what about us having a soft heart and that we would be open to coaching? open to assessing. Maybe there's a grain of truth in what they're saying. You know, as a church leader, the, my worst thing is I'm just pouring my guts out here. When someone's leaving the church and then they come to my office and they basically just dump about how awful our church is. And it's very hard at that point to say, well, what can I learn here? Because everything rises up in me and say, can you just stop now and can you just leave my office? But actually, even our worst critics can be a coach for us if we are willing to have our ears open to learn and to hear. And how much better when we have people who love Jesus and love us confronting us with truth and seeking to help us to live full on for Jesus. This first section, we also see that his mission was clear. 
He had a very clear mission. He was calling people to repentance toward God and to faith in Jesus. Repentance and faith. Repentance, big Christian word, it's very simple. Repentance means I was walking in this direction. I was doing my own thing, and I got to a point where I have a change of mind. And my change of mind means I turn 180 degrees, and instead of going that way, I go this way. And now I'm moving toward God, acknowledging that my way was wrong and His way is right. That's repentance. It's turning to God, having a change of mind. And notice he says faith in Christ. It's not faith in faith or, or faith that there is a higher being or there's, there's a God out there. No, it's specific and directional. Faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's his mission. He wants everyone to turn from their own way of life to God and put their faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And when we talk about faith, there's a big difference between the strength of your faith and the direction of your faith. So you can be on top of this roof and you can have very little faith that the ladder I brought from up the road that we made ourselves that leaned against the roof will hold you. And as you begin to climb down off the roof and it's a bit rickety, you get to the bottom and realize, I had very little faith, but that ladder worked. The other guy, no names mentioned, sitting in the front row here, could be on top of the roof thinking, I've got so much faith that as I spread my arms, I will fly down. And with the greatest amount of faith, Dave leaps off the building and face plants into the pavement. You see, he had a lot of faith in the wrong direction. The other person getting on the ladder had very little faith in the right direction. And so, brothers and sisters, I want to say that when Paul's calling us to put faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ, it, the direction is what counts, not how strong your faith is. You can have a very little bit of faith, and you will be saved because it's on Him, not on the strength of how much faith you've got. You may be like me, and you may doubt a lot. You may wake up some days and say, I don't know what I believe, but Jesus help me in my unbelief. And you will be saved. And I want to say to you, if you're here this morning and, and you would not consider yourself a disciple of Jesus, you kind of think going to church might be good for you, or you are seriously pursuing Jesus and you want to know more, I want to encourage you to put what little faith you have in the person of Jesus Christ. He will never let you down. You see, the Bible teaches that he gave up his life so that we could live. Application for us from this first section is, let's be those that live in a way that can say to others, follow me as I follow Jesus. That's what Paul was doing. Follow me as I follow Jesus. And I really want to say, it doesn't matter what your track record has been so far. You could have walked in here with a track record of faithfulness zero. You may be on the setup team and you have never shown up once and let them down every time with a lame excuse. Wonderfully, we get to turn over a new leaf because of the gospel, because we serve a gracious king. And because he's gracious to us, we're gracious to one another. And so we can... We can make a decision today, Lord, I, I want to live faithful. Just like Paul was faithful in all the stuff he went through, I want to be faithful to follow you too. This is the beauty of the gospel. And actually the power for living faithful is the grace of God. It's the kindness of God. It's the gospel that enables us to get to the end and say, wow, I finished the race. See, this is the, the transformative power of the gospel is actually God comes, the Holy Spirit lives in us, and He becomes the engine that enables us to be faithful from the inside out, not trying to pull your boots up by the bootlaces. 
not trying to pull your socks up and do better. I'm going to be, I'm going to work harder. No, it's the God working in us to enable us through the power of the gospel to be faithful. And so if you're not a, if, sorry, if you would not consider yourself a Christian here, I'm not calling you to work harder. In fact, if you're a Christian here, I'm not calling you to work harder. I'm calling you to lean into Jesus. Lean into him. second section we come across here is Paul is now talking about where he's going. He's heading to Jerusalem. It's like looking forward. And there's some fascinating things he says here. He says, I'm constrained by the Spirit. The going to Jerusalem, he feels constrained by the Spirit, held captive by the Spirit of God to do the will of God. His options have been narrowed. I don't know if you've ever experienced this where you feel constrained by God into a particular direction. Maybe you felt constrained to remain in Joburg. I was saying to Tono earlier, one of the things about living in this part of town is I've felt so sad by the number of for sale signs since COVID in our area. It breaks my heart when I hear of more people moving to some Gulf estate on the coast It breaks my heart to hear of some people moving countries. I love this country. I love this city. And so I want all those lack of people to stay here. But I don't know if you felt constrained by God to remain in Joburg. Or how about this? Felt constrained by the Spirit to remain in your job, even though you've got a really attractive offer somewhere else. More money, cooler workspace, overlooking the sea, and you felt, no, God wants me here in this job with these people. Anyone like that? Awesome. Some hands. That's what Paul was feeling, constrained for a purpose. He's constrained to go to Jerusalem where he knows trouble is waiting for him. So when Lauren and I, um, we came up to Joburg in 2004, planted the church 2005, and... uh, I'd been working for Coronation for about nine and a half years, about a year in. And my job, my career was just like about to soar. I hated my job for the first six years, and I was just loving my job. Finally, I was beginning to reap some financial benefit (laughs) of my corporate days. And uh, the leaders came to me and said, listen, this church is growing really fast. We need some help. Can you leave that job and come and work for the church? And it actually was a really easy decision for us, despite how cool things were looking at the time and work. Because I felt constrained by the Spirit that He had brought us to Joburg to plant a church, not to enrich ourselves. And so the decision was actually quite easy to make at the time, because it was like, no, this is what God's brought us. I felt constrained to it. And that should be our expectation, that we feel some limiting of options for the purposes of God. That's what Paul's talking about here. Bound to the Spirit of God so as to do the will of God. The next thing we see here is he knows trouble is waiting for him. Now, if you like me, which I think you probably are, because there is some commonality in these northern suburbs uh, people, is I'm pre-programmed to avoid pain and suffering. Is there anyone else like that? Yeah. I like my comfortable life. I'm pre-programmed to avoid pain and suffering. What we see from Paul here is he is content to know that tomorrow is going to hurt. He's content with that. Now, the only time I'm content with that is when I go hiking. I love hiking, and I know that it's going to be sucky. There's going to be pain, and there's going to be suffering, and it's not going to be pleasant. But I embrace it for the joy set before me, the joy of getting to places that none of you oaks who don't hike will ever go. I can take a photo and say, there, see how nice it is. For the joy of seeing views that you don't get to see unless you walk up that mountain. 
for the joy of sitting around a campfire just talking rubbish with some guys about some stuff. See, there's something about Paul here, like Jesus, who embraces the suck because he has a long-term view. Jesus, on his way to the cross, he embraced it for the joy set before him, right? Paul, he's going knowing that trouble awaits, and yet he is faithful to the call of God on his life. He's looking forward, just like Jesus was, and he's determined to press on. And I just want to say, don't let people talk you out of pursuing Jesus. Don't let people try and make really sane arguments about how first you need to do this or first you need to do that before you follow Jesus. Because there is a cost. It's like going back to my story when we were uh, leaving the corporate world and uh, my dad, God bless him, he, uh, he just said to me, you know, why don't you just wait till that bond is paid off? Before you do this thing. I think he was also thinking, why don't you just chip into my retirement fund before <laughs> you do this? Because he'd invested so much in my education. But the point is, people who love us will often, because they love us, try and say, well, maybe that's a little too risky. Like Paul had these guys all around him. You can't go to Jerusalem. They're going to kill you there. They're going to hurt you. Don't go. Sometimes it's freeing not to have to know what the future holds, not to worry about things that could happen, because we trust God that where the chips fall, He determines. He determines where the chips will fall. And there's no cost that we can pay. There's no cost that compares to the incredible prize that awaits those who continue to the end, who finish the race. You see, God is in your future. He knows. You don't have to make a plan. You don't have to make things work out. What he requires of us today and tomorrow is that we would be found faithful. That's, that's it. What we see here is Paul does not count his life as precious. See, the framing of his faithfulness to this journey is because his life is not that important to him. This is a problem for me. I suspect some of you, this might be a problem as well. See, for most of us, our present lives are very important. Our present lives are the most important thing going on in our minds and in our world. But to be a faithful people, we must be willing to lay down our lives, lay down our desire for comfort and leisure and pleasure and our own glory. In Luke 9, Jesus says, For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. I feel like Paul got some of that. And I want to say to us, brothers and sisters, being faithful to Jesus is the most important thing in our lives. More important than our fame, our fortune, our reputations. The other day I was chatting to someone and uh, they were saying a family member of them, theirs, was nearing retirement. And uh, he'd been living really frugally his whole life. But he had a list of things now that he was going to do. So he's saving up, being like very frugal, building up for that day when he retires. Because at that point, he was going to do stuff. He was going to travel. He's going to enjoy life like never before. It reminds me of a story Jesus told. I'm not going to tell you the parable, but I think that's a very dangerous way to live. And as the person mentioned the word retire, I began to think, what is retirement? Because the definition of retire is to withdraw from danger, withdraw from action, to fall back. To go to bed, I need to retire, I'm a bit tired. To march away from the enemy. And there's some modern dream in this retirement, but there's no foundation in Scripture for it. And so when your company 
says to you, or when you are the company, and the company says, Kev, enough now. Time to retire. What you need to say is you can call it retirement if you want. I choose to see it as a change in my station. A new front in the war. A new assignment for the king. I am going now to Jerusalem. So some of you approaching 65, I don't know where you retire now, 70, it's time now to say I'm now going to Jerusalem. A new front in the war. You see, so as long as you are breathing, as long as you are living, you have a job. You're on mission with Jesus. And while we have breath, let's do what he's called us to do. You know, I was so proud. There's a, a couple in our church in their 80s, and um, she had a nasty fall, and Lauren and I popped around to visit them this week just to see how she was getting on. And she was so grumpy in a good way. I was like, we're like why, Sue, why are you so grumpy? She says, no, man. We're in the middle of Alpha here in our retirement village, and now this thing has happened. And I just thought, these guys, they just, they're just running. I didn't even know they're running an Alpha course in their home, in the retirement village. They're like, you guys need to pray with us. We're tired of the enemy disrupting our plans here. I just thought, that's it, man. We keep going as long as we've got breath. We see here Paul has died to self but come alive in Christ. And I want to remind us, like Paul's not our hero. Jesus is our hero, right? But like this guy set a great example, but he is the same as us. He's, you know, sometimes we think Apostle Paul, he's like got an S on his chest. He's like, you know, uber Christian. He's just like us. He had the same temptations, the same distractions. Us northern suburbs, Oaks, we're full of distractions in our lives. There's all the shiny stuff around us all the time trying to distract us. Paul had the same distraction. It might not have looked like yours. He didn't have Netflix or whatever that thing is. But he was battling the same things as we were. But how is it that he was faithful even to the point of death? I want to suggest that maybe it was because he was already dead. He'd already died. And I think the problem with me, if I look at him, I'm not judging you guys. If I look at me, I'm still too alive. There's still too much of Greg alive here. And not enough has died to Christ. And I, you page forward to, to Timothy at the end of his life. Paul writing, he says, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid up for me the crown of of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but all those, sorry, but to all who loved his appearing. Faithfulness is better than life because beyond this life, there's a life that goes on forever and ever and ever that is awesome. That is absolutely awesome. And those that are faithful here, those that are faithful here will be welcomed in with a crown of righteousness. Paul's writings are full of this kind of stuff. 2 Corinthians 4, he says, For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So he's heading to Jerusalem. He knows what's coming, but he's thinking about what is to come. You see, faithfulness, brothers and sisters, is us finishing the race. It's us finishing the race. And finishing the race means unimaginable joy forever and ever and ever. See, his mission was to finish his course, to pour himself out. I want to ask you, what is your mission? What are you living for? See, he sums it up here by saying, he was testifying to the gospel of the grace of God and preaching the kingdom. Making known God's grace and His kingdom. And that's our confidence for living faithful lives. That's a confidence that we can have because we have a God who is king. And a king is able to reward those who faithfully pursue Him. But also He's full of grace so that we know that He will do what He says. And we know that He will graciously give us all things. He rewards the faithful.
third section, a bunch of charges and warnings. He warns them to pay close attention to their gospel, their theology, their integrity, which makes me assume he paid close attention to those things. He commends them to the grace of God because ultimately it's God's grace that will see you through, not your accountability group, as good as that group might be. Your, what do you call it? Discipleship. What do you guys? Not your community group, those other things. Don't you have, like, you used to do those intentional life on life. Your life on life, those, that's not going to get you to the end. It's the grace of God. And Paul is so confident in this because he knows that it's God's grace who found him. Remember, this dude was on a road to Damascus persecuting Christians, wasn't looking for Jesus, and Jesus came to him. I don't know about you, but that's my story. God came to me. And in fact, I, theologically, I know it's true for all of you. It wasn't your intelligence that found him. God found you. It was his grace that found you. And it's his grace that carries you through and presents you one day to the Father. So he commends them to the grace of God. And then he says, it's more blessed to give than receive. He, he, he says, don't covet, be generous. And I think if we're going to be faithful, we have to deal with the money issue in our lives. We have to deal with the fact that actually I'm called to be a blessing, not to be just a receiver of blessing. And then our final section. I call it final departure. There's this genuine affection, love, family vibe. There, it's not some transactional relationship he's got with these people. It's not like a business dealing. He's invested his life relationally. He spent a number of years in Ephesus. These people, these Ephesian elders, they are deeply connected. I think if we're going to be faithful, it means giving our lives, not just our smiles and hi. What? Wave and smile. No, it means investing our lives with one another. And the final thing we see there is the relational cost of mission. You see, it's been my experience that you say goodbye to your friends for the sake of the gospel. Again and again and again. Church planting means you say goodbye to people you love and you care about. But wonderfully, the day is coming when we will be reunited with our Father in glory forever and ever and ever. So brothers and sisters, I want to call us to emulate Paul, but actually we emulate Christ, because he is the most faithful one. I'm so grateful for Tonna's reading earlier. Jesus was the faithful one, and we get to follow him. And someday we will hear our Father say, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. You've been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. In Matthew 25, it says, he then says, enter into the joy of your master. Man, the joy set before us is going to be awesome. And so we have an example in Paul of how to live faithful. We've got Jesus' work on the cross and resurrection that is the foundation for us to be faithful men and women. And finally, we've got the Spirit of God alive in us enabling, helping us to be found faithful until the end. So why don't you stand with me? I'd love to pray for us, and then we're going to go to the communion tables. You might want to close your eyes just for some privacy. Yeah, Father, I want to thank you that you are God and King, but I want to thank you that you're our dad and that you love us and that you're for us. I want to thank you that you have made your spirit available to us to enable us to live this life. We could never live the life you've called us to without the help of your Holy Spirit. And so, Father, I want to pray for my brothers and sisters here this morning. 
all of us, I, I want to pray that you would fill us afresh with your spirit, that you would enable us to live faithful, that we would be faithful to your call to be witnesses in our city, that we'd be faithful members of this local church, that we would be faithful spouses, that we would be faithful friends, faithful brothers and sisters. Why won't you help us, God? I want to pray particularly for Parkhurst Community Church. Lord, I want to pray that you would help this church hold the course that you've set for them. I thank you for, for this church, Lord. I thank you for what you've done here, the many lives that have been transformed through the ministry of this church. I pray that you would blow wind in their sails, that you bless them, Lord. And Lord, I do pray for any here that would not call themselves Christians. Lord, I, I do pray that you would give them faith to believe in your son, Jesus. Father, won't you give them faith, even a rickety, weak faith, but help them to see the beauty and majesty of Jesus, to understand the work that he accomplished on the cross in dying so that we might be forgiven our sins, that our shame could be put away, that we could be reconciled to you. I pray for that faith to be born in their hearts. And if that's you, I just want to point you to Jesus, the faithful one. Yeah, I just, if there's anyone like that, I just want to encourage you not to just walk out of here this morning. Won't you come after the service and just catch myself or Tono and just say, won't you please pray for me and, and just talk and start a conversation. We'd love to help you to come right with God. But Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for this time. Won't you bless us? Thank you for communion, Lord, and the, the time we have now to remember your death and resurrection. We do love you, Jesus. Everybody said, Amen.